So I'm constantly preaching at the American church, at Western Christianity. Uh, but just so we can see that we do have balance here in this church, we shall now preach about the comfort of the Lord for his people. The message is entitled, The Right Place for Anxiety, Concern, and Worry. Even though the Bible tells us, Jesus specifically tells us, do not worry, and yet it just seems to be part of the human condition. We worry. We worry about our bills. As we have a family, we worry about our kids. We worry about things at work. We worry about things we see on the news. We worry when we look at the Colorado River drying up and Lake Mead at 25% of its capacity and wonder, will our children have water once we're gone? <laughs> These, we can worry about things in the world that are big. We can worry about things in our hearts that may be small to everybody else, but to us is bigger than anything else we could imagine. We know what anxiety is. We know what concern is. We are familiar with worry. And I am glad that the Lord, he knows our frame, that indeed we are nothing more than the dust of the earth. And he is gracious to us in our anxieties, with our concerns, and with our worries. And which is why so much of the Bible is filled with his comfort regarding these things. Paul tells us, don't be anxious for anything, but by prayer and thanksgiving, you know, offer to the Lord your supplications, the things that you have need of. Jesus, when he said, don't worry, balanced it by saying, your father wants to take care of you. Your, your father has you in his hands and in his eyes. Your father hasn't forgotten about you. And Jesus is, is one of the great brilliances, if I can say this, about his Sermon on the Mount is he is continually pointing God's people to God, but as Father. And that was really a revolutionary thing. The Old Testament from time to time reveals God as Father, but not in the way that Jesus did when he came. Jesus presented him as a Father who is gracious with his children, desiring to help his children, wanting to give good gifts to his children, wanting his children to know he will protect them, he will care for them in this world. And so I bring you this morning to 1 Peter chapter 5, two brief but wonderful verses that perhaps no Christian has ever exhausted his understanding of these verses throughout the millennia of the church. Therefore, Peter says, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. That perhaps is one of the more difficult things for any person, for any Christian to do, to truly learn humility. But once we learn humility, we will then begin to learn that other great difficulty, which is worry and how to cope with it. And he says, casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. Casting all your anxieties upon him, for he cares for you. Casting all your concerns upon him, for he cares for you. Casting your worry into his hands, knowing that he cares for you. This is such a, a wonderful verse, a verse that perhaps many of us committed to memory as children, or maybe when we first became Christians, to cast all our care upon him because he cares for us is one of the most wonderful truths of the Christian faith as we walk in this life. We come to the cross of Christ and he deals with our sins and we experience his great salvation. And after the high, if you will, of that conversion experience begins maybe to wear off and we begin to realize, wow, the, the world hasn't changed around us. I've been changed, I've been converted, and yet uh, the world still carries on and it keeps throwing concerns at me. It keeps making me feel anxious about the things that it confronts me with. And once again, I have things that I'm worried about as I traverse the path of this world. Well, spoiler alert, 
the proclamation of this pulpit this morning is that the Lord is faithful to his people. That, that is the end goal of this message, to re-emphasize and to re-establish in your hearts the faithfulness of God to his church, to his people, to this church family, and to you specifically and individually. The Lord is faithful. He is faithful to his people. And they, or we, we can and should, moreover, we are invited we are called by our Heavenly Father to turn to Him in all of our distress. No matter what comes our way, we are to turn to Him in all things with all of our needs because He cares for us. But the reason we can believe this verse is based upon first that we are His people and the Lord is faithful to His people. You do not have to read much of Scripture. You do not have to go through many books of the Old Testament or many epistles in the New. Before you begin to realize a common theme in Scripture is that God is faithful, and He is faithful to those who are His. He is faithful. You are not a faceless group. We will not be a faceless group in heaven. He knows each and every one of us. He numbers the hairs on our head. He knows all things intimately about us. We, we don't need to hide anything from him. We can stand before him openly and unashamed because of the blood of Christ. We are his people. The Bible even tells us in Revelation that when we arrive at his gates, one of the things we, we will receive is a new name a name that is known between he and us specifically and individually. Jesus reminded us that the way he views his people is like a shepherd who cares for his sheep, wants to take care of his sheep and protect his sheep. And Jesus says, I have sheep and they know my voice, they follow me. He has sheep that he names and he calls and they hear him, they're familiar with him. And that is how we are to be familiar with his voice and ever desiring to follow him. He is a stronghold in the day of trouble. That's what Nahum the prophet declared. And he says, the Lord knows those who are his. Those who belong to him do not escape his attention. He looks upon them and cares for them. He cares for you. And so, as we desire to get more into what Peter is saying here, to really understand this great and wonderful verse, I think it's important we understand it in light of the rest of his letter. And I think it will give us a better understanding moving forward how to apply this into our own lives. Peter wasn't someone who just wanted to write nice words. Wouldn't it sound nice if I said, hey, God cares for you? Hey, don't worry about things. But you'll notice in verse 6, we begin with, therefore. Because of the teaching I have laid down for you, because of the foundation upon which you stand in Christ, that's why I tell you, and you should know yourselves, be humble before the Lord and trust Him to lift you up. Be humble before the Lord and trust Him to provide for your needs. Be humble before the Lord and do not be lifted up with pride wherein you begin to think, it's up to me to worry about this. And don't take all of this anxiety, these anxious feelings upon yourselves thinking, I've got to come up with a solution. I need to resolve this concern. I need to solve this problem which worries me. Now, the Bible calls us to be wise, and the Bible gives us a, a foundation in the Word of God, with the truth of God, and with the ways of God to live a wise life so that we can resolve problems. But it's not resolving them in our own power, strength, wisdom, and philosophy. It's resolving them based on His truth 
knowing he cares for me, he has given me this, I can trust him. And so as I seek his face, as I bring my petitions, my supplications, and my prayers to him for the things that cause me anxiety, for the things that are concerning my heart, for those things that worry me until all my hairs are gray, I can bring it to him and know that he will take care of it. And as I trust him and follow his word, his will will be done on earth in my life, just as it is done by his throne room in heaven. And so the letter up to chapter 5 establishes first and foremost that those who have trusted Christ, those who have put their faith in the Lord Jesus, those are indeed the people of God. See, for this verse to apply, you, you first have to be in the in crowd. You, you first have to be part of the people of God whom he cares about before you can then start throwing your cares upon him knowing that he cares for you. You have to first be in the group that he cares for, the group that he protects and watches over. And so the first couple of chapters, Peter lays out our place in the kingdom of God Moreover, our place in the family of God, those of us who have come to Jesus Christ and have put our faith in him and thereby have been adopted by the Father. So a few things that he mentions here, we'll go over these sort of quickly, but in chapter 1, verse 2, he reminds us that we are elect. We are those that God has chosen to care for. And I love sort of the Trinitarian formula that he gives to us in verse 2. He speaks about how God, by his foreknowledge, has brought us to himself. He has chosen us for his people. And he speaks about the sanctification of the Spirit in our lives, that we might, uh, for obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. So the entire Trinity, the triune God, each person within that Trinity is at work in the lives of his people, in the lives of the people of God. So right away, that should give us a firm confidence and a firm foundation on which to stand. If we are those who have been saved by the blood of Christ, we are those who have been elect by God. We are not random people in the kingdom, if you will. We didn't sort of sneak in the back door. No, he knew us, he set his face upon us, and he says, I choose you to be one of my people. In verse 3, he mentions that we have been begotten by him. Once again, Peter helping us to identify God, not just as our creator and our righteous judge, but as our loving and gracious father. He's building a foundation Way before he ever gets to chapter 5, verse 6 and 7, he starts here in chapter 1, setting up the foundation upon which we stand. In verse 4, he reminds us heaven has been reserved for us because we have been chosen by him and begotten of him. In verse 5, he says, because we're his people, we're his children, we are kept safe. We are kept spiritually safe by his power. In verse 7, our faith, those of us who endure, our faith is proven genuine by our endurance. Because we go through those anxious thoughts, we go through those grievous concerns, we go through those times of worry, and we do not abandon our faith in him, we endure. We endure. We do not give up what has been given to us by the Lord. We endure. And that proves that this faith that has been produced in us, this faith is a genuine faith. He mentions in verse 8, we have yet to see the Lord Jesus. Now, Peter, speaking as an eyewitness, he knew the Lord Jesus. He spent over three years with Jesus. But he writes this letter to those in the early church who had never had the opportunity to see the Lord Jesus, never had the opportunity to hear his preaching or to see one of his miracles. 
he writes to those who love the Lord, although they've never seen him. And we fit into that, don't we? We are those who have yet to see the Lord Jesus. We look forward to the day of his great revelation to us, yet we love him now. We're not waiting till we see him to decide whether or not we will love him. We love him because he first loved us. We love him because we have heard the gospel. We love him because he died for us. And even though we have never seen him, he is the one that we serve. He is the king whom we follow. In verse 18, Peter mentions how we have been redeemed with the precious blood of Christ, our king. In verse 21, our faith and our hope are in God. In chapter 2, verse 3, we have tasted of the graciousness of God through his gospel. In chapter 2, verse 9, once again, he says, we are a chosen generation. We are a special people. So this is the group. These are the people. Those who have put their faith in Christ, those who are the saved in Jesus' name, these are those who by faith can cast their cares, their anxieties, their concerns, their worries. We are the ones who have this great privilege to trust that God cares for us and is concerned for us and will take care of all of that which we throw his way, all of those cares that we heave upon him. He is not only able, but he is willing. I love those stories in the Gospels where somebody who is in need of help, a sick person who is in need of a healing, they reach out to the Lord Jesus and they say, Lord, if you're willing. They're not sure at that moment. You can almost see the tears in their eyes. You can almost hear the quivering in their voices. They know that he has healed others, would he heal me? Lord, if you're willing, would you heal me? Would you lay your hand on me? And Jesus, I love his reply, I am willing. Don't doubt my willingness. I do care for you. Cast that care, cast that sickness, that fear of my way, because I am able and I am willing. I think that's one of the things that bothers Christians most when they suffer. I think we automatically assume God is able to do whatever he wants. We, we just start there. You can do whatever you want, so why don't you help me? Lord, why don't you use some of that power on my behalf? You, you own the, the cattle on a thousand hills and the gold in every mine. Can you take care of some of these bills? What are you holding back for? Come on, you paved the streets of heaven with this gold. Can't you just throw a few pennies my direction? And sometimes we can wonder when our heart is broken over our, uh, a relationship or one of our children or whatever it is that comes against us. And we wonder, Lord, why are you letting this happen? We must never forget that he is more than able. He is willing. He is willing. But the second thing that Peter begins to speak about in his letter is that we suffer. And our, our faith has to make room for the suffering we endure in this life. You see, I have said time and again, Romans, 8 chap, uh, Romans chapter 8 verse 28, where we have this confidence that, that all things are working out together for good, for those that love God and are chosen according to his purpose. That verse, first of all, has to be true to the martyr that wrote it. Paul was beheaded for his faith. Did all things work out together for good for Paul? The man who's writing this letter would also be executed by the Roman government. Was all things working out together for good for Peter? He's talking about being chosen in the Lord, right? Well, he's chosen. He loves God. He, he, he mentions these things. Love for God, being chosen. Did his martyrdom upend Romans 8.28? Did Paul's? 
What about the millions of Christians who were martyred in those first few centuries of the church? What about the Christians that we will talk about in November during our International Day of Prayer for the Persecuted Church? What about the Christians today that will lose their lives? Does their martyrdom upend Romans 8.28? So then it is important that our theology makes room for the experience of Christians through the ages. It must make room for verses which tell us those who live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. It must make room for the words of Jesus to his own disciples who said, they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you. And you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. It must make room for those beatitudes. Now we're all familiar. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. But we don't like the last one, do we? Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is also the kingdom of God. And then he goes on. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely. Rejoice, he says. You ever wonder where James got that? You know, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Well, he got it from Jesus, who said, Rejoice when you suffer, when they hate you, when they speak evil against you. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad. Lift your hands to heaven and praise. For great is your reward in heaven. And that's how Romans 8.28 must be interpreted. It must be interpreted in light of heaven, not in light of losing your life. In fact, Jesus again, he, he's a radical preacher. Maybe we should listen to some of his sermons. He said, if you hold on to your life, you're going to lose it. But if you lose your life, and how dear such a verse must have been to the martyrs and those who suffered in the early days as well as those who suffer and die today. If you lose your life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel, you will have it. You will keep it. You will hold it. You will have life. And so our theology has to be conformed to the theology of Jesus and the apostles and to Scripture so that when we suffer, we don't say, well, things aren't working out together for good for me. Because that apparently isn't what this means. What it means is you have a home in heaven. And no matter what happens here, everything is working out together for good. How can that be? What, what about when my life is in shambles? Well, look at the book of Revelation. You read about God's people suffering under the power of the beast. You read about God's people being executed for not bowing down to his lies. But what does it tell us over and over and over again about them? They held on to the testimony of Jesus. And they had victory over the beast because of their witness for Christ. That is how all things work out together for good for those that love God and are chosen according to his purpose. Because God's purpose for you and for me is our testimony for the Lamb and our witness for Christ. In our suffering, when we're anxious, when the concerns and the worry overwhelm us, or like many Christians, maybe not in this country, maybe not with people we're familiar with, but today there are Christians who gather in fear for the authorities to come and arrest them who are praying for loved ones who are floundering in prisons, who are praying for those who are destined to be executed, that the Lord might deliver them. Even in the book of Acts, Christians had to face this dilemma. Why does God deliver some and not others? Why was James beheaded and Peter was freed from prison? In the book of Acts, why does Peter get an angel to escort him out? Why, why do Paul and Silas, their story is, is interesting, right? They're, they're uh, in chains in Philippi. And the Lord delivers them with a big old earthquake. But before that, they get beaten half to death. <laughs> and after they're beaten, it, with the bruises and the welts and the blood pulling at their feet, they praise the Lord and sing hymns at midnight. 
And that's what shook the prison open, I say. That's what got God to move on their behalf. Because the same God who we are told his eyes scan to and fro throughout the earth, looking for those on whom he can show himself strong on their behalf, he's still doing that. Who is bearing witness for me? Who is a testimony for the Lamb? That's the one who's going to see that all things are working out together for good. Not those who hold on to their anxiety, who embrace their concerns and, and keep their worries away from God because I'm going to figure this out, who, who feel like they can't trust the Lord. The Lord's not going to show himself strong on their behalf. He's looking for those who will trust him, who believe that he cares for them. And so Peter acknowledges as he goes through the second half of his letter that the Christian life, not just life, but our Christian life, can be one of strife and conflict, sadness and sorrow. Just because we're saved and we have the joy of the Lord in our heart, and that joy may indeed be our strength, it doesn't really make it easy when we suffer, when our hearts are broken. It simply gives us a greater purpose. It simply gives us that future hope. It simply keeps us going when we'd rather just fall down because we know that he does love us. And so in chapter 2, verses 11 and 12, Peter speaks about the importance of living a godly life, but even if you do, some will still speak evil of you. Life is hard. Life is full of suffering. In chapter 2, verse 13 through 17, hey, be submissive to the rule of law in whatever country you live. And yet, you're still going to experience the foolishness of ignorant men because life is full of suffering. In chapter 2, verse 18 through 25, hey, if you're a slave, don't rebel. If you're a slave, don't try to escape. Don't be a fugitive. Be submissive in your work. But he says, some of you, though, no matter how submissive you are, your master will be harsh and your life will will be a hard and difficult one. But be submissive anyway. Did they slap you on the right cheek? Turn the other to them also. Don't, don't, don't fight back. Be like the lamb. When they spit in his face and when they reviled him, he reviled not again. He speaks to women in his congregation who may have had unsaved husbands, who, who may have been brutal. He, he says, who are, who are not obedient to God's word, who are rebels against Christ, but yet you are married to them. He says, be submissive, be kind, be gentle, be respectful, even though your spouse may oppose the very word of God itself. In chapter 3, verse 9, he says, be loving and kind, even though people will still hate you, even though it won't make them like you all of a sudden. Oh, look at that Christian person. They're so loving and kind. I'm going to change my attitude towards them. That doesn't always happen because life is hard and full of suffering. What did Job say? But that man is destined to suffer and women too, as you know, just as the sparks of the fire fly upward. But he gives us the example of Christ. In chapter 2, verse 21, we are called to walk in his steps. And those steps were not always easy. Foxes have holes, birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. And then, of course, he went to the cross, and he suffered, and he died at the hands of those who hated him. Even though, what had he done? He had preached God's love. He had preached repentance from sin. He had healed the sick. He had opened the eyes of the blind. He had opened the ears of the deaf. He had, he had raised the dead. And yet they put him on a cross. We are to walk in his steps, steps of suffering. And yet we're seeking first the kingdom of God, no matter, just as he did. He is our example. That's why Peter says in chapter 3, verse 15, a verse you probably know, sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts. That's, it's right in the middle of the, the book. And it should be right in the middle of our hearts. Sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts. He has to be lifted up in your heart. He has to be set apart in your life. He has to be your end goal. 
He has to be your one and only aim. He has to be the king you are following. No matter what goes on in your private life, in your public life, in your professional life, no matter what's happening, no matter what is filling you with anxiety, no matter what is causing you concern, no matter what you are worried about, Christ must be sanctified as holy in your hearts as the Lord. He's the Lord, no matter what's going on. If you believe that he is in control of all things and that he has your life in the palm of his hands, then he is the one who is in charge and he is leading you through this path of suffering. Trust him for he cares for you. This is the mindset with which to face all of our struggles. Notice in chapter four, verse 12, beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial. That's how sometimes these anxieties, concerns, and worries feel. They're just engulfing you in flames. You're not sure if you're going to make it, which is to try you as though some strange thing had happened to you. But rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. The present suffering cannot be compared with the future glory. We have to see all things through that prism, through the prism of Christ, through the prism of his own sufferings. That is where we will find purpose in our sadness, where we will find meaning in our struggles and in our brokenness. When he finally reveals himself, when you stand face to face with Christ, you will be glad that you endured for him, that you trusted in him. When you look into his eyes, you will realize what you by faith believed all along, that he really does care for you. And so humility before God must be our posture, no matter what mode of suffering comes our way as we return back to our verses verses 6 and 7 of chapter 5. To humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God. Oh, he's able, he is strong. That he may exalt you in due time. No matter what you're going through, he's the one that can pick you up. Casting all your care upon him, no matter what it is, for he cares for you. We, we must hear and obey. We must hear and obey this command and abandon our anxieties to the hands of God and cast our cares upon the Lord. Peter, no doubt, had been thinking on Psalm chapter 55, verse 22, when he was writing this letter. For there he found the words of David, who said, cast your burden on Yahweh, cast your burden on the Lord and he shall sustain you. He shall never permit the righteous to be moved. And no doubt this was stirring Peter's heart as he wrote and causing him to say to God's people of his day and to us today, the Lord cares for us. And we have every reason to trust him with our anxieties, with our worries, with our concerns whatever it is that burdens us. And, and I like how he uses this word, he cares for you. He cares for you. We see this word in another story in Peter's life, a story recorded by Mark in chapter four, verse 38 of his gospel. There they were, the disciples, on the Sea of Galilee. Jesus was asleep. He's asleep in the boat, his head resting on a pillow, Mark tells us. But the disciples are fearing for their lives. The Sea of Galilee has reared up its ugly head and there is a great tempest on the sea and a storm so fierce and fearful that it caused them to believe that they could be drowned this very night. And they went to Jesus, they woke him up and they said, don't you care that we are perishing? Don't you care about us? Don't you care what's going on? And Peter uses that same word 
No doubt a word he remembered using quite negatively. Don't you care for us? And here he tells you and me, he cares for you. He cares for you. When I was on the Sea of Galilee, didn't know if I was going to make it through. I wondered if he cared. But I found Jesus to be faithful every step of my life. And you will too, because he does care for you. He does care. And our lives can be just like that raging sea. We can be anxious because of everything roiling against us. As the seas of our life are unsettled and begin to roar and the waves crash against us, we can feel overwhelmed, but we must never forget that he cares for us. The key that Peter learned is what he gives to us here. We must keep Christ first in all things. We must keep him first. We must sanctify Christ as Lord in our hearts. We must believe that he does indeed care for us even when the seas are raging around us. Peter's answer here is simple. Trust him. Trust him. Trust him. And with that, let us pray that he might increase our trust for him. Heavenly Father, we thank you for these simple yet profound truths. We thank you, Lord, for these wonderful and precious promises. Lord, you are such a great high priest that you can sympathize with our lives because you have experienced the same things that we have experienced, yet you were without sin. But Lord, you can see us with our anxieties, our concerns, and our worries. And you invite us to come to you that we might receive grace in time of need, that we might receive mercy when we need help. Oh, Father, help us by your spirit to be strengthened in our faith in you, that no matter what comes our way, we will believe that you're faithful and we will be obedient to cast over our anxieties, to cast over our cares and concerns, to cast over our worries to you, and we will believe that you care for us. Father, bless these, your people. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.